So in this section of the class, I want to talk a little bit about the history and the founders of sociology. So if you look um, on this particular slide, which is the, in the first set of your slides, um, there are three major theorists, and we're going to go over a couple more. Um, these are not the only ones, but these are some of the more famous uh, theorists who contributed to the development of sociology. Let's start out with Comte. Comte is considered the founder of sociology. Many of his works were translated by Harriet Martineau, who was a sociologist in her own right, but because of her gender, um, was not allowed some of the uh, latitude and um, academic respect that Comte was. So Comte is the founder, and he said that in society, uh, there are two major forces. Social physics is what he called sociology, and then he said those two forces were social statics and social dynamics. Social statics are the forces of stability in society, what holds society stable, what keeps things the same. Social dynamics are the forces of change. When Comte developed the idea of sociology, um, the idea that you could study people wasn't really widely accepted, that you study people in the same way that you say studied biology. And so that's why he used the term social physics. The natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, were well accepted, but the social sciences were not. Spencer is British. He's famous for two ideas. Social Darwinism, which is the idea that only the fittest and strongest survive and, and rise to the top of society. I think you should make a note that that's very controversial, and we can talk more about why that is. The organic analogy is the idea that the human society operates in much the same way as the human body. So for Spencer, the body and the society are similar in that they're made up of all these different parts that are interrelated and interdependent, and they have to work together to make the body function smoothly, right? And he said, you know what? Society is the same way. There are different social institutions that have to work together to make the body, or I'm sorry, make the society function smoothly. And he called that the organic analogy. In other words, the idea that the human society and the human body operate in much the same way. So, for example, in the human body, you have organ systems. In the human society, you have social institutions, is what we call them. Durkheim is French. He was studying to be a rabbi. You'll find that a lot of these early sociologists were very religious. Durkheim is famous for doing an empirical study called La Suicide. By the way, W.E.B. Du Bois also did an empirical study that many people think is sort of more solid than Durkheim's. But the idea in an empirical study is that you can go out and collect data. He felt that it wasn't just our job to come up with theories about society, but to actually go out and test them. And so he developed this theory about suicide. And he felt that a person's likelihood of committing suicide was connected to their level of social integration. Social integration means how connected you are to other people. And when he went out and collected the data, what he found was somewhat different from what he expected. So when you are an empirical sociologist, like people like uh, Du Bois and Durkheim were, you, you make these hypotheses before you collect your data. So his hypothesis was greater social integration would decrease your likelihood of suicide. In reality, he ended up finding something more complicated than that, that there were different types of suicide. So let's go through these types. In anomie suicide, your social integration goes down my little arrow down here, um, and your likelihood of suicide goes up. So these are cases when the society is sort of falling apart and people are losing their connections to others, and it increases the likelihood of suicide. It could be a great social upheaval. It could be a civil war. It could be a natural disaster. But we know that society is sort of under duress, and that's why people are committing uh, suicide. On the other hand, you have a fatalistic suicide. In fatalistic suicide, you're very highly integrated and your likelihood of suicide goes up. And what do I mean by fatalistic? Well, you're so highly integrated that you don't even get to control your own body or where you go or who you associate with. So in prisons, for example, people are highly socially integrated, 
they're connected to others, guards, prison, prison guards, wardens, whoever else, even other prisoners, sort of influence what you do with your life. You don't have a lot of choices. Someone tells you when to eat, when to go to bed, who to, where to sleep, who to hang out with, who you can't hang out with. And when you lose that sense of control like that, what you find is that you're more likely to commit suicide. But in this case, you're very highly integrated. Altruistic suicide also involves a high level of social integration. You're so highly integrated in altruistic suicide that you're willing to give your life for the betterment of the group. So for example, the classic example is the kamikaze pilots in World War II. They were willing to die for the Japanese empire, right? To forward the cause of, of the Japanese empire. And so what did they do? They gave up their life for what they perceived to be the betterment of society. And that is an example of what I'm going to call altruistic suicide. You should be thinking in your head of possible, possibly other examples of suicide that might fit into these four. One, the last one on here is egoistic suicide. In egoistic suicide, you're so highly integrated, or I'm sorry, <laughs> back off that. Your level of integration goes down and you're so isolated, I didn't mean to say integrated, that you start to feel sort of personally alienated. So your social integration is going down at an individual level. It's not because the society is falling apart, it's because you're falling apart. Maybe your spouse died. Maybe all your people who you liked moved away and they're not your friends anymore. Maybe you're not able to get out because of coronavirus and you feel alone. And so you say, you know, I just, I feel like I want to take my life because I don't have these social networks to support me. That's egoistic suicide. If you look at the United States, one of these is way more common than the others. And I want you to think about what that might be out of these four. Um, the next one is social facts. Social facts are general statements. This is something that Durkheim came up with. He said, you know, if you do this empirical research and you collect data, you can make certain general statements about society. For example, you might be able to say that one group is more likely to vote in a certain way. So, for example, our research shows us that um, whites are more likely to vote for Republicans and African Americans and Asian Americans and Latinos are more likely and Native Americans too are more likely to vote for Democrats. Doesn't mean everyone in the group votes that way, right? But we know based on research, not just my personal opinion here, but actual research on voting data, that these groups are more likely to vote in these ways. That is a social fact. Women report higher levels of depression than men. By the way, notice I said report. You can say that women are more depressed, but they're more likely to report that they are. Not my opinion, that's data, that's research, and that's where social facts come, and that's why it's very important for sociologists to rely on social facts and not just personal opinions. We need to look at studies, and Durkheim is the person who sort of guides us in that direction. All right, so let's talk about the next 